Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Schloss. I'm the director of the Division of Genome Sciences in the Extramural Research Program at NHGRI. Uh, let me welcome you to the continuation of the seminar series, A Quarter Century After the Human Genome Project's Launch, Lessons Beyond the Base Pairs. Uh, I'm pleased today to introduce uh, Dr. Marco Mara as the fifth speaker in this NHGRI seminar uh, series commemorating the 25th anniversary of the launch of the Human Genome Project. Uh, you may have noticed that uh, Dr. Mara is not physically present, but instead is joining us by video feed. Um, unfortunately, a last minute scheduling conflict uh, arose for him, and rather than canceling and thus missing out on Dr. Mara's presentation, we decided it would be better to proceed even if it meant using the wonders of the Internet to bring us together electronically today. Uh, Dr. Mara received his Bachelor of Science degree and PhD degrees from, uh, from Simon Fraser University. He pursued doctoral, postdoctoral training at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Uh, eventually holding a number of positions at the university's genome center, genome sequencing center. There he contributed to the Human Genome Project uh, uh, by developing and implementing technologies to map the human genome while working with Bob Waterston and the team at WashU. In 1999, he moved to the Genome Sequencing Center at British Columbia Cancer, uh, Cancer Agency and then joined the Department of Medical Genetics, University of British Columbia in 2000. Dr. Mara now serves as the head of the Genome Sciences Department and the director of Canada's Michael Smith Genome C Sciences Center at the British Columbia Cancer Agency. He's also head of the Department of Medical Genetics Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia and adjunct professor, Department of Molecular Biology and Biochemistry at Simon Fraser. Uh, the Genome Sciences Department focuses on the development and application of genomic, bioinformatic, and proteomic assays to problems in human health, particularly cancers. The Genome Sciences Center represents an internationally acclaimed innovation group that encompasses DNA sequencing, bioinformatics, and technology development in Vancouver, Canada, with a major focus on the study of cancer. Dr. Morrow has, uh, has received many awards. To mention just a few of them, he was uh, appointed as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 2007 and elected to the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences in 2009. Dr. Mara is a member of the Order of British Columbia, and recently he was listed in the 2014 and 2015 uh, World's Most Influential Scientific Minds by Thomson Reuters. Uh, Dr. Mara's career achievements so far are undeniably impressive. Undoubtedly, his contributions to genome science and cancer research will continue to influence our knowledge of human biology and to improve human health. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark O'Mara, whose talk is entitled, let's see if it's the same, pretty much, from back clones to uh, cancer genomes, the role of the HGP in launching a career in science. Marco. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, uh, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I apologize for not being able to be there with you all today. Uh, we are attempting a recruitment, uh, and, uh, and so I'm required uh, to uh, participate uh, in that. I'm very grateful uh, to Kiara and, and Chris and Jeff and Eric for giving me the opportunity to participate in in this somewhat unusual uh, venue. I, I hope it works for you. I'd be interested in, in uh, whether it does actually at the, uh, at the end of all of this. So the, the topic that uh, Eric and I chatted about really was around this business of how uh, the Human Genome Project uh, propelled me uh, forward into a career in science. Um, rather than, you know, the things that we're doing uh, right now, uh, how, how did this experience shape me uh, for, uh, for this career that I have now uh, invested the last uh, quarter century in, I guess, or very nearly that. Uh, so I'm going to spend a, a fair amount of, of time talking about uh, the good old days, because I think the good old days are, are fundamental to, to how I approach uh, problems and, and how I approached um, the wonderful opportunities afforded to me uh, in the Human Genome Project. Uh, working with luminaries like Bob Waterston. 
uh, and John Salston. So, so uh, the relevant, <laughs> hopefully relevant, personal history uh, is shown here. Oh, and before, before I go on, I, I forgot to tell you that I'm not in the room by myself. Uh, so I have uh, some, uh, some very kind uh, students here with me who, who felt sorry for me sitting in a dark room all by myself and have come to lend their, their moral support. Uh, and so they are in the room uh, with me here. Okay. Uh, so, in terms of the, the personal history business, so Jeff told you that I, I, I did my PhD work uh, uh, in Burnaby, BC, which is just beside Vancouver, uh, and, and that was all about really worms uh, and worm genetics and trying to, to uh, identify and clone out uh, genes that, when mutated, yielded particularly interesting phenotypes. That experience was absolutely uh, fundamental to my decision then. Uh, to go on and, and pursue training uh, at Wash U, uh, working with Bob and, and Rick and Elaine and all those good folks. Um, and it was during that time, uh, towards the end of my tenure uh, at Wash U, uh, that uh, I was exposed to uh, various opportunities in cancer research. And we're not going to touch on those today, uh, but uh, those were very important uh, experiences that I, I want to acknowledge up front. Uh, and then since 99, of course, we've been uh, doing things in, in the uh, British Columbia, Canadian and international environment uh, where uh, now I find myself uh, uh, musing on how we might use fruit flies to pursue some of the uh, interesting problems that are uh, emerging from, from our, our cancer genomics efforts. But in 1989, I was uh, more or less uh, unaware of a thing called the Human Genome Project, uh, and, uh, and it was during that same year that, that this important paper uh, was published by Jim Watson and Elka Jordan, uh, which laid out a description of, of the evolving Human Genome Project. Uh, and I was aware of this paper, uh, although I had absolutely no idea that a few years after it was published I would be uh, in some way or another engaged in, in the conduct of the program. Uh, instead, in 1989, uh, I was uh, confronted with this beautiful organism, Cinerapditis elegans, uh, and uh, 25 years before I encountered C. elegans as a research tool, Sidney Brenner uh, had published his, his seminal work on, on the genetics of, of the animal and its utility as, as a genetic model organism. Uh, and so this, this was a, a holy grail to us C. elegans uh, geneticists back in the day, this work of Brenner, and then Following on that, uh, the work of Salston and Horvitz uh, in mapping out the, the gene lineage uh, or the, the cell lineage of the animal. And that's uh, trying to get my pointer up here so you can see where we're at. Oh, there we are. So that's what's depicted here is the post embryonic uh, cell lineage of the worm. And then, of course, uh, a number of people were continuing to do intensive mutagenesis screens uh, looking for genes of particular interest. Uh, using chemical mutagens, radiation, things of that sort. Uh, and that's basically what our uh, lab was engaged in uh, at the time. So the, the, the way that one approached one's studies uh, back in, in those days uh, really was, well, you know, identify some interesting phenotypes and then uh, off you go, go clone the gene uh, and prove that the thing that you had cloned uh, was in fact uh, the uh, entity responsible for the phenotype uh, when it was mutant. And so this cloning business was incredibly laborious, even in a genome as small as the worm, uh, about 100 million base pairs, uh, we now know. Uh, and so meandering around in the genome, trying to find uh, the base change that identified uh, the mutated function uh, was, was exceptionally tedious uh, and would have been um, much more tedious had it not been uh, for this wonderful uh, physical map. Uh, and so Coulson and Salston, Brenner and Carnes um, published uh, a paper in PNAS in 1986, uh, which laid out the, the evolution of a, a clone-based physical map of, of C. elegans. And so by the time I entered uh, into my PhD studies, this clone map uh, had, had been expanded and was growing and while it wasn't complete, was already making an enormous impact on how people approach gene cloning. Uh, Waterston uh, then got involved, uh, along with Yuji Kohara, 
And they brought in a, another very important reagent uh, into the mix, and these were yaks. And so what's shown below here are some short lines. These are uh, generally cosmid clones. Uh, and then these longer lines, these depict uh, yeast artificial chromosome clones. Uh, and these uh, reagents, these clones representing the genome, uh, were positioned one against each other by virtue of a couple of features. Uh, and one was this, uh, this fingerprinting method that had been devised uh, by, uh, by Alan and John, in which uh, clones were subjected to uh, restriction enzyme digestion, and the restriction fragments were labeled and then resolved on polyacrylamide uh, gels. And so what this shows is a marker, uh, and then lanes of clones, and then another marker, and lanes of clones, and so on and so forth. And so the idea was that uh, each clone would yield a stereotypical pattern of restriction fragments, uh, and commonalities between restriction fragments could be used to infer that two clones were, were at least partially overlapping. And by doing this uh, over and over and over again uh, in a random way, uh, one would build up a, a deep map uh, of the genome. And this deep map then would have these clones arranged with respect to each other. Now, where it became even more important from the, the cloning perspective uh, is, I think, uh, shown quite well on this particular slide. So what we have on the top here is a, a genetic map of, of the worm. Uh, and, uh, and these markers uh, generally have been positioned with respect to each other on the genetic map uh, using standard genetic crosses. Uh, mapping against uh, other mutations and also against uh, rearrangements such as deficiencies. And so the, the position of these genetic entities on the map was known, uh, and then you could use things like the breakpoints of these deficiencies and map those onto cosmic clones, uh, and thus define the interval in which the gene of interest must lie. And in this case, this is a paper from... Um, uh, the Sternberg lab, in which the cloning of lethal 23, which turns out to be the, uh, a worm homolog of the, EG, the human EGFR receptor, was reported. Uh, and so this very quickly was able, this genetic uh, mapping followed by use of the physical map, was able to get you uh, to a, quite a small interval. Uh, and then you could test each one of these underlying cosmic clones uh, shown here for their ability to rescue uh, the phenotype of interest when injected into the germline uh, of the animal. So, so this was amazing because through the availability of the clone resource and, and through the, the very extensive uh, genetic tools available to C. elegans uh, researchers, uh, one could localize uh, the position of the gene. One had a clone, uh, a 40 kilobase clone in the case of a cosmid or much larger ones in the case of yaks. And and these reagents could be obtained, so you could phone or email, they had email even back in those days, uh, and you could email to, to uh, request the clone, and, and Alan uh, Coulson would uh, put the, the clone uh, in an, an auger plug and mail it to you, and it would show up, and you could, you could work with that uh, as a cloning reagent. So this was amazing. And so uh, we, uh, in the lab that I was working in, and many, many C. elegans labs, uh, around the world, our, our research was transformed by the availability uh, of this map. And so these people uh, who, who were involved in, in launching the whole thing became, you know, my scientific heroes at the time. So uh, there's Bob Waterston up there, uh, and uh, John Salston here, Alan Coulson, Sidney Brenner. John here, or, or sorry, Alan, is standing beside uh, how people used to interrogate the map in those days. This is a, a series of pages printed out and stapled to the wall at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, where the map is displayed, and people would wander along and ask Alan, well, you know, how's the contig coming in such and such an area, and so on and so forth. And, and this was uh, really a, a revolutionary thing. So uh, those people uh, were, were viewed as, as the pioneers, uh, and, uh, and I was uh, quite keen to learn more about how such people thought and how they conducted their science. Uh, they were not the only people uh, that had contributed to the map, however. Uh, this business of yaks I've alluded to uh, as being uh, very, very critical. And so what the yaks did was allow um, uh, longer stretches of the genome to be linked, uh, and so they would span regions that were unclonable, and in some regions that were unclonable in cosmids, and overall contributed to the contiguity uh, of the map. So yaks uh, were incredibly important. Uh, and in a paper in 1987, 
uh, by Burke et al. Uh, Yaks are described. So, so Maynard uh, Olson became uh, a, a very important figure, uh, even in the worm community, although um, it wasn't necessarily uh, well recognized what the contribution was in the early days. The axe became fundamental to, to closure of the map. But that's not the only thing uh, that Maynard contributed to my early thinking. Uh, he published this very nice paper uh, in the same issue uh, as um, uh, Coulson and, and Salston published their paper on a, a rather different approach uh, for uh, genomic mapping, uh, this in yeast now, where smaller in insert clones were used, but a fundamentally different method for producing the fingerprint uh, was employed. And so shown here is not a polyacrylamide gel, uh, but rather an agarose gel, um, very, very high resolution, very carefully cast and run, DNA fragments visualized through the application of ethidium bromide. And so uh, these were, were representative in some, in a lane here, of, of fragments from a, a clone. These w were representative of the total insert uh, of uh, the clone being analyzed. In the Sulston and Coulson method, uh, the total clone insert was not visualized, but rather only a portion of it. So this gave us uh, uh, the opportunity when you summed up all these fragments to, to know what the clone insert size was and to know the sizes of the individual uh, restriction fragments themselves. And these could be arranged uh, to produce these, these very wonderful high resolution and deeply redundant restriction maps that span uh, large regions of the yeast genome. So at the time, uh, this business of, of making maps as a way to access the genome uh, was being driven by uh, by Maynard and by uh, John uh, and Bob and Alan. Um, and uh, around about the time that I was finishing up my, my PhD, I thought, well, you know, what is it uh, that, that I uh, must pursue? What am I uh, keenly interested in? And this business of the genome, uh, by this time, it in, had infected me. Uh, I needed to know uh, how to interrogate the genome. Uh, and I needed to, to see uh, large stretches of, of these maps uh, to be happy, <laughs> and I needed uh, to see sequence. And so I, I uh, went to Wash U uh, and interviewed with, uh, with uh, Bob Waterston and Rick Wilson in 1993 in October. Uh, and what I uh, came to do was sell them on the idea uh, that perhaps uh, what we ought to be doing as a companion project to uh, the C. elegans project was uh, mapping and sequencing uh, a nematode that was related to C. elegans, this, this one called C. briggsi, Cinerabditis briggsi. And the rationale uh, was as follows. So if, if, and we knew this from various studies that had been published where short snippets of sequence had been investigated, if you did a, a sequence alignment of C. elegans and C. briggsi, CE and CB here, uh, what you could see is uh, substantial areas of sequence conservation, and that's indicated, for example, in all these little dots, that's conserved sequence, uh, and that these substantial regions of sequence conservation tended to be found in regions that were either coding or, up here, uh, regulatory in nature. And if you were to look at an intron down here, uh, substantial sequence divergence could be seen. So this became uh, a way uh, to uh, find genes and the elements that, that control the genes. And so the idea was sequence C. elegans, sequence Briggsy, align the sequences, uh, and, uh, and use the resulting uh, um, orthology or homology, if you like, uh, to identify uh, coding sequences and the regions that regulate them. And so that's what I, what I, uh, I really wanted to do. Uh, as for my postdoctoral work, and, and uh, that seemed interesting, and I now know that, that uh, these thoughts were not unique in any way. People had been uh, thinking about doing C. Briggsy for some time. Uh, I went back and, and wrote my thesis and uh, thought about uh, where I was going in life and all these kinds of things, uh, and about eight months later, uh, showed up in August of, of 1994, I think it was, to, to begin uh, my work and uh, was very pleased to, to make some friendships that I think have uh, lasted for uh, a quarter of a century and hopefully beyond 
these are people that were absolutely fundamental in, in bringing me into the, the Genome Center and providing all manner of opportunity to a very green kid uh, from the boonies uh, and introducing that very green kid to, uh, to the wonders of, of the genome. So Rick and Elaine, uh, very influential. Ladina Hillier uh, in the informatics space, uh, an amazing talent. And Bob and Lucinda Fulton were, were very welcoming uh, when I arrived and did their very best to, to teach me things uh, <laughs> uh, with, uh, with maybe some success, I don't know. Uh, so uh, other additional uh, important figures in, in those, those early days are shown here. So Stephanie Chisso, uh, right here, who's now with GlaxoSmithKline, uh, uh, Mark Johnson, who's uh, head of genetics in Denver, I believe. Uh, these folks uh, were in the same office as, as I was put. Uh, and, uh, and we uh, established a, a close working relationship. Mark was, was busy uh, annotating yeast sequence. He was, uh, uh, you know, allegedly on sabbatical uh, playing with these, these yeast sequences. Uh, and Stephanie was coming in uh, as a postdoctoral fellow for Bruce Rose Lab uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, and Stephanie knew all, all the process, you know, Bruce Rose Lab had been uh, doing this kind of work. She was a sequencing expert uh, I, I was not a sequencing expert. I was a, a C. elegans guy. Uh, and so Stephanie did her very, very best to take me under her wing and expose me to, to the mysteries of the process uh, and, uh, and the tools being used. Mark uh, made, made uh, all manner of, of rather different impressions upon me. Uh, he introduced Stephanie and I to the wonders of, of White Castle. Uh, and uh, we frequently ate there for reasons that I simply can't defend anymore. <laughs> Uh, he also introduced to me various secrets for um, avoiding administrative entanglements uh, and, and the colorful language he used can't be repeated here. Uh, but we, we had a, a lovely interaction and it was during these, these early days that I met this fella who is, is well known to you all. Uh, that's Eric having a conversation with Maynard uh, taken from uh, a photograph that I think appeared in Nature. So these were the people that uh, more than any other uh, single thing uh, or, or collection of tools made uh, the experience at Wash U uh, so incredibly wonderful. Uh, and as I arrived and Stephanie was teaching me about how you sequence genomes and Mark was teaching me about White Castle, uh, I was exposed to, to the process of, of sequencing. And this process uh, was, was reported in a paper in 2005, and by this time had gone through many iterations, but I think it, it serves uh, the purpose for which I intend, which is to lay out um, this, this pipeline, which was really built around uh, processing individual large insert clones. Uh, and for the most part in C. elegans, these, these were cosmids. And so there was a, a group that was involved in mapping the clones, and there was a group involved in manufacturing uh, sequencing libraries from the clones and then uh, the, clone, uh, the clones carried in, in uh, bacteria would be plated and, and picked into microtiter plates using robots and so on and so forth. Uh, and then at the end of this process, uh, the, the clone sequences went on to this, this group called the Finishing Core. And the Finishing guys were people like Bob and Lucinda and others, and, and they understood uh, how to take a collection of, of sequences that emerged from the sequencing machines and, and assemble them and achieve a very high quality sequence product uh, that, was, that was contiguous. And so uh, it was decided um, through a, a, some kind of a, a discussion that occurred between, between Stephanie and, and Bob and Lucinda, I'm sure, uh, that I ought to learn how to, how to do this finishing business. And, uh, and that would be a, a good thing for me to, to uh, wrap my head around working out the topology of the relationships of these, these sequence contigs and stitching together a final finished product and, and through that I would learn uh, about sequencing. So, so Bob Fulton decided that I really had to have my own clone to finish uh, and he gave me this clone MO3A1. Now MO3A1 uh, is, uh, as you can see up here, on chromosome 2 of the worm. Uh, back in those days, uh, MO3A1 had only a couple of neighbors. It had a cosmid over here, and it had a cosmid over here. And so to span this region of DNA sequence in the worm genome, 
it really was MO3A1 or nothing. And because the ambition was to produce as, as finished a product as possible, uh, this, this clone needed to be finished. And so my task uh, was to, to finish it. And I'm, I'm unhappy to report that I failed miserably in that task. Uh, so the objective was to produce uh, basically a bunch of gene predictions from the sequence of that clone. And as you can see in this, uh, this nice GenBank entry today, uh, that's all been done. But at the time I confronted it, uh, the clone was in all little pieces. So here's a piece and a clone. And here's another little piece and another little piece and another little piece and another little piece. There are all these sequence pieces. And what this picture shows, this is a, a, a program written by Jeremy Parsons, who was an informatician at WashU at the time. The lines connect uh, repeated sequences. So there were all these sequence repeats, uh, some of them arranged thus, some of them spanning contigs, some of them quite complicated. It was these sequence repeats that, that defeated me. I, I couldn't make heads or tails out of this. Uh, and so I was a miserable failure. Uh, I am happy to report, however, that in 2012 there was an update to the entry and, and somebody actually finally uh, did finish this thing. Uh, so it's, it's not a gap with my name on it in the genome anymore. And of course, we all know uh, that the sequencing effort was, uh, was largely successful. So uh, I want to go back to that, that slide um, of ACDB, and I, I just want to make a couple of points here. So there's MO3A1. Uh, that at the time uh, was all lonely in a gap. Uh, this, this clone uh, materialized later, uh, as did many others, and, uh, and they're shown here. So these other clones now uh, are, are showing up due to efforts uh, in Vancouver. A fellow named uh, Don Mormon played a role in mapping these cosmids, or phosmids rather. Uh, the phosmids now are, were different than cosmids. They had an F-factor origin of replication uh, they propagated a single copy. Uh, the cosmos were multi-copy. They were much more stable uh, in, in bacteria. And so the point, I think, then the take-home message that I got out of all of this is that, well, you know, having a bunch of different vectors uh, was absolutely essential if you were going to have a high-quality map. You needed things that complemented each other, some grown in yeast, some grown in bacteria. You needed single origin, multiple origin. You needed all these, these different clones integrated into an effective map. Uh, a real breakthrough in, in mapping uh, and, and uh, cloning very large chunks and being able to propagate them in bacteria came with the report of, of BACs, uh, which uh, were capable of carrying 300 uh, KB of, of DNA and, and had an F-factor origin of replication, which could maintain clones in single copy. Uh, and so with the advent of BACs, which were reported uh, in 92 here, but which were in use before then, uh, with the advent of BACs and the realization that clone maps could absolutely be used to fuel sequencing, uh, also the realization that I ought not to be a finisher, uh, this led uh, really to, to a new assignment. And that assignment uh, was really, you know, the problem of, of how to build a clone map uh, to organize the human genome sequencing. So, this, this problem was presented to me at a time when a decision had been made uh, that maybe the most important thing to do wasn't to pursue the Seabrigsy genome anymore, but uh, due to various uh, occurrences that uh, perhaps the human genome uh, ought to be the target. Uh, and the rationale for making a clone map to, to organize uh, human genome sequencing, I recall as being something along the lines of what's shown on, on this particular slide, uh, which was basically that, that these large insert low copy clones could represent with reasonable fidelity uh, uh, large portions of the human genome and because they were clone based could be integrated with uh, the, the other maps that were available for human SDS maps, probe based maps, uh, so on and so forth and this would enable uh, contigs assembled from these large insert clones to be placed onto, onto the human genome. Now, it was, it was pretty clear that this map needed to be of fairly significant redundancy. That's what the, the yeast and worm examples had told us. Uh, you could, with a deeply redundant map, you could achieve contiguity. You would have some estimate as to the clone overlap. Uh, and if you sequenced overlapping clones, the idea would be that you would have, over, uh, you would have long regions of contigu contiguous sequence. 
in the event that a, that a clone uh, was not uh, of high fidelity or uh, perhaps uh, was not obtainable or had been lost, there were re replacement clones made a, uh, that could be made available as a consequence of, of this deep redundancy. And then finally, uh, having uh, the sequencing effort organized by clones was, a, I think, a particular advantage, or viewed as being a particular advantage in the case of, of um, uh, the public project, because uh, clones could be allocated to different sequencing centers, uh, in essence allocating chunks of the genome to, to these various centers. Uh, they could work in parallel uh, with minimal wasteful redundancy of effort, uh, and this would speed uh, the, the production of the human genome sequence. And so uh, I was privileged to be, to be offered the opportunity to, to think about uh, how such a map uh, could be built. Uh, and it's at this point that I want to make some other uh, uh, important acknowledgments to, to folks that uh, provided all kinds of, of um, assistance and support uh, and uh, enabled the, the creation uh, of, uh, of a human clone map. Uh, uh, Tammy Kuchaba was, uh, was a person who worked with me through thick and thin for five and a half years, uh, helping with the, the fingerprinting effort and, and the express sequence tag uh, effort. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, Jeff Wessner and John McPherson, uh, good friends uh, who commiserated uh, as appropriate when times of difficulty emerged. Uh, Peter, of course, uh, was, was very important uh, to, to me uh, and uh, made excellent clone libraries. Kerry Soderlund uh, had developed a software package working with John and Bob uh, at the Sanger Institute uh, called FPC. And uh, FPC uh, turned out to be um, available, ready to use, could be adapted uh, for the kind of clone fingerprinting that we eventually decided on, and, uh, and she was a, a big supporter of, of moving the technology and helping us uh, with her code. And then uh, finally, um, uh, Dan Furman, who, who was an engineer at WashU, electrical engineer I recall, uh, who got very interested in the problem of automated detection of restriction fragments uh, through the production of software that we collaborated on called BandLeader. Uh, so those, these were some of the folks uh, that maybe you don't hear about all that often in, in the development of, of uh, the human map and the resulting sequence, but uh, they were really critical uh, to the effort. So we, uh, we had to imagine how we were going to do this, uh, and of course uh, there were a few options available immediately. We could try and replicate uh, the method that Alan Coulson and, and uh, John Salston were expert at, and so that was taking these clones and uh, labeling uh, restriction fragment ends, uh, and then running a representation of the, of the restriction uh, digest of a clone on a polyacrylamide gel. And then there was uh, Maynard's approach, which uh, involved purification of DNA, uh, a rather uh, simpler restriction enzyme digestion and, and resolution of the fragments on an agarose gel. And after experimenting with, with these and a few other ideas, uh, and considering the magnitude of the problem, uh, that, that many hundreds of thousands of clones would have to be fingerprinted, and that these were large clones, um, we, we eventually concluded that the way that we were going to do this uh, was uh, essentially using agarose gels uh, and, uh, and mini preps uh, to, to process clones. And this was uh, featured on, on the cover uh, of genome research in 1997. Uh, those of you that have thought a little bit about agarose gels uh, and have run them know that, that this is not a standard depiction with the, the top of the gel being down here and the bottom being up here, but I guess it appealed to the artistic talents of genome research, and so that's the way it's presented, uh, as well as, our, as our, our rationale here for pursuing uh, uh, this particular approach. And so the strategy uh, that we reported on uh, in this particular paper uh, was as follows. So we would take uh, probes or STSs and we would use these to identify arrayed clones. So these would be uh, clones that have been spotted onto, onto hybridization filters, for example, or subjected to PCR assays. Uh, these clones then uh, could be fingerprinted. Uh, and then the fingerprints could be compared uh, the idea being that uh, a specific STS 
would identify in a deep enough library clones that overlap, and you would like to know more about the identity, the nature of those overlaps. Were the clones completely identical? Were they slightly different? Did one extend further to the left and the other extend further to the right, and so on and so forth? And so that was the, the general strategy that we pursued. Uh, and you would produce data using uh, uh, a lot of technology development that went on to, to, uh, to do this, uh, these kinds of, of high-resolution gels, where very tiny amounts of DNA, prepared in 96 well format by this time, uh, were, were digested and re resolved by agarose gel electrophoresis and visualized uh, by Cyber Green. Uh, and so what you can't tell easily is, is this, this band here, which is up in the 20 kb range, all the way down to a few hundred base pairs down here. And so that was the approach uh, that, uh, that we reported on and, and we went on uh, in the paper to show that, uh, that clones um, identified by uh, common SDSs could in fact uh, differ uh, and that you could see uh, new bands arising as you walked across a contig. Uh, and if you uh, did this deeply, you could extend the contig, uh, recognizing the overlaps, finding the, the, the new fragments and using these new fragments to walk uh, uh, further distally. Uh, we also showed uh, in the paper that the restriction fragments were, were quite accurate. Uh, and so within a few percent of, of real size, except for clones uh, up here in, in the 12 kb range or, or greater, these fragments uh, could not be accurately sized to, to much better than about uh, 3 to 5%. So that was the basic technology uh, and, uh, that, that we eventually evolved uh, and then applied uh, and reported on uh, in this paper, which was published in the same issue uh, as the initial sequencing and analysis. And uh, what you can see here now is uh, uh, how an evolution of, of the gel format. Now we have 121 lanes of data uh, by this time, we're not using SDSs anymore. We're just doing mass fingerprinting in a random nature, in a sense, uh, shotgun fingerprinting all the clones and libraries, assembling the fingerprint patterns to each other. And then as a consequence of this assembly, uh, having these very, very large uh, contigs uh, of back clones for the most part, which uh, could then be placed onto uh, SDS maps uh, by hybridization or actually by sequence data directly. And so that became the way uh, that, uh, that we contributed in the fingerprinting map to the sequence effort. Uh, but by this time, by the time this paper came out, uh, we were already uh, in operation here. And so uh, although I'm listed as participating from the Wash U side, we had set up shop here and Stephen Jones, the head of informatics at our, at our center, had devised a way to parallelize uh, FPC so that very rapid whole genome assemblies of this sort uh, could be completed. And so that was uh, a contribution made uh, to the overall effort from Vancouver. Uh, and of course, we all know uh, that uh, the, the sequence reported here was, uh, was generated largely from, from uh, uh, these kinds of clones uh, in, a, in a consortium of a sort that uh, I have uh, never before, never since uh, seen. It was really quite amazing. Uh, you'll be happy to know, though, that, that, that you know, I had not forgot about C. Briggsy, although I hadn't been engaged in it, and so somewhat parenthetically, uh, the genome did get mapped and it did get sequenced, and this was reported uh, long after I had departed uh, from Washington. So it did happen and remains uh, a, a valuable comparative uh, data set to this day. So uh, round about uh, 1999 or so, um, I had the opportunity to consider uh, a role uh, at, uh, at the BC Cancer Agency. And so I was approached uh, variably by uh, Dr. Michael Smith, who is shown in, in this particular photograph. He, he uh, was a laureate in 93 uh, for site-directed mutagenesis. And he had been approached by a guy named Victor Ling, who was the vice president of research at the Cancer Agency. And Victor had a vision uh, in which he would, he would very much uh, aimed to set up a, a genome center uh, focused on, on cancer. And uh, he called Mike up. Uh, Mike at the time was uh, pursuing um, basically a research sabbatical, although Mike called it a postdoc, uh, with Maynard Olson in Seattle. And so Mike and Maynard were, were friends, uh, and uh, Mike was having a great time uh, working with Maynard on uh, various problems related to, to the genome. 
uh, and, but Mike was persuaded to, to become the founding director, uh, recruited uh, myself and Steve Jones, um, uh, reuniting us in essence. Uh, we had been graduate students together uh, in, in Burnaby uh, and uh, he had gone to the Sanger Institute to work on genome sequencing from the bioinformatics side and, and I had gone to Wash U and, and so we were collaborators over this period of time. Uh, so a decision was made, and, uh, and I, uh, uh, along with Steve, uh, joined Mike, and the first thing that we really got up to was, was more of this fingerprinting business, more of this clone mapping. And so this became possible uh, because, uh, thanks to Bob Watterson and, and the National Human Genome Research Institute, we were able to enter into a subcontractual arrangement in which we uh, started to, to fingerprint clones uh, to support the mouse effort, at least initially. And so a variety of, of technology development exercises transpired uh, over the years from uh, loading devices capable of loading 96 walls at a time. That's what's shown here with fancy ferromagnetic uh, fillings. Uh, we constructed special fridges to keep our beautiful agarose gels uh, at the proper humidity. Uh, we had industrial scale agarose gel pouring uh, big, huge devices and, and cooling implements that we would deploy, uh, and, uh, and then uh, staining cabinets where we could stain many, many, many uh, of these, uh, these gels uh, using CyberGreen and then prior to imaging them. And so we had eventually ended up with, with uh, a setup. This is one bench. There were four like it. Uh, double deckers. You see these gels running. Each gel is actually two gels, so there's 242 lanes of data on each one of these things. And these things would chug away night and day and make an awful racket uh, with these peristalsic pumps in operation. People would walk around uh, with earphones to, to block the noise. Uh, but the data were, were uh, quite amazing. Um, and uh, by this time, the band leader software that, that uh, Dr. Furman had uh, developed with us was being used in a mostly automated way with about 97% uh, sensitivity and 95% specificity. So most of the fragments, even those in multiplets, such as these guys here, were correctly identified. Uh, and this then became the foundation for uh, the eventual production uh, here of uh, something like 5.5 million fingerprints, mostly backs, uh, for 63 different species. And, and much of this was funded um, by the National Human Genome Research Institute. And, and so that those efforts contributed to uh, mouse genome maps. And uh, there's the Norway rat, for example, a uh, macaque. Uh, was part of it, cattle part of it, uh, and, uh, and locally, uh, while we were contributing all those data, we started to develop reagents for um, uh, microarrays, back clone microarrays. Uh, Martin Stravinsky uh, used the map to identify a set of back clones, about 30,000 clones that spanned the genome, and this was then deployed uh, to uh, generate uh, DNA microarrays, looking at copy number changes in, in cancers. Along the way, uh, Martin decided that you know, it was absolutely critical uh, that we have some way of visualizing these clones and their relationship to each other, and so he invented this thing called Circos, and, uh, and I think most of you have probably seen uh, depictions of this. It's now uh, used not uh, only for visualizing back clone fingerprints, actually it's not used for that at all as far as I can tell, uh, but rather visualizing sequence relationships. It has become a very a common way for people to display uh, sequence data, and that was done by uh, Martin Stravinsky. So back clone mapping became the, the dominant uh, uh, high throughput, large scale uh, production activity uh, at the Genome Center uh, from you know ninety nine uh, until about two thousand and six. And so for a seven year period, that that was primarily uh, what we concerned ourselves with, uh, believing that. The production of these data was contributing usefully to, to high quality reference genome sequences. Uh, we were also doing some, some modest sequencing, of course, uh, and uh, uh, again, had the opportunity to collaborate with Eric Green um, uh, in a variety of papers on the mammalian gene collection, uh, Bob Strasberg uh, as well. We had a brief interlude with the SARS uh, virus in 2003. Uh, and mostly uh, got uh, actually quite uh, quite good, if you'll pardon uh, the expression, at making uh, DNA sequencing libraries from limiting amounts of material, including microdissected material and laser-captured dissection-collected uh, material. 
And so this, this proficiency with libraries and the, and the large number of, of very diverse libraries that we were making, largely for uh, uh, purposes such as uh, uh, SAGE and EST sequencing, uh, led directly to the uh, invitation from Selexa in 2006 uh, to uh, participate in a technology development exercise in which our particular role was going to be developing methods for uh, library construction suitable for analysis on this absolutely revolutionary brand new platform. Uh, so that was, that was a, a milestone moment uh, in our evolution as it was for many others uh, and signaled a departure uh, away from um, back clone fingerprinting as a, as a dominant activity. Uh, it was shortly after this point in time uh, when we retooled and, and focused our energy on, on this then new uh, next generation uh, DNA sequencing. And we're fortunate to, to be involved in a, a variety of, of different consortia over the years in which this, this sequencing uh, was deployed uh, in support of various things. So the, the center, uh, you know, has, has grown as a a direct consequence of, of all of that history to today occupy 50,000 square feet across two sites and uh, employs about 320 um, and uh, has a very training emphasis having trained um, more than uh, 500 um, undergraduate, graduate, and postdocs over the years. Uh, today uh, we, we are uh, heavily invested in, in next generation sequencing technology as well as um, mass spectrometry infrastructure and have a fairly considerable uh, compute infrastructure and have used this to, to uh, focus mainly uh, on malignancies uh, and over the course of, oh, well, 2009 would be down here someplace, have generated uh, on this particular trajectory now uh, slightly more than a petabase uh, of DNA sequence from uh, something like uh, 63,000 individual libraries. So that's the, the business of clones to, to cancer, if you like, that I alluded to in, in my second slide. Uh, what I'd like to do now in, in the next few minutes is, is just talk a little bit about malignancy. I couldn't resist the opportunity to, to uh, uh, make a few observations. Uh, and these, I think, are, are to be considered in the context of where I think uh, we're going. Uh, with our own effort here uh, and where I believe others may be going uh, with the application of, of genomics tools to characterize cancers. So uh, in, in this particular uh, milieu, this big pie chart of things is microRNA-seq. Uh, and so there's been many, many thousands of microRNA-seq libraries that we've uh, generated and processed and contributed uh, to the TCGA over the years, as well as some, some RNA-seq. And of course, we all know uh, that uh, that ICGC, TCGA, uh, these entities have produced, uh, uh, if you like, reference sequences for for many malignancies. We've contributed to the TCGA effort and been grateful for that opportunity. We've contributed uh, uh, rather differently to a, a project or so in, in Canada, uh, listed here. Uh, and as we've, we've gone through uh, this exercise of, of profiling these malignancies using various modalities and analyzing the resultant sequences, um, I think the field has learned uh, a great deal about uh, the, the anatomy of cancer. And first and foremost, what has been revealed, I think, as a consequence of all the sequencing is the incredible heterogeneity um, uh, of malignancy. Uh, heterogeneity... Uh, from a variety of different perspectives, clinical outcomes, heterogeneity in terms of, of differences in clinical behavior and metastatic nodes within the same individual, uh, and, and heterogeneity from within a single mass. And I, I've just cartooned um, uh, what I hope will, will make my point for me. So tumors really are, as we've learned, communities of cells. Uh, and so you can, you can think of a, a community of cells, different color, different genotype, uh, the surrounding microenvironment, different cell types, different functions, each color representing a different function or a different genotype. And this, this milieu of cells uh, is really, you know, cancer. Uh, and the amazingly high number of cells uh, that one can get in even a relatively small tumor is, is illustrative, I think, of the, 
the fundamental possible complexity of the disease. You know, you can fit, so I'm told, 100 million cells um, in uh, a space about the size of a sugar cube. So these communities of cells, they talk to each other, but they're also dynamic. Uh, they can co-evolve. Community of cells under selection, maybe by drug, uh, certain genotypes may disappear from the population, certain genotypes may expand. That may be true in the microenvironment as well as in the tumor population. And so over time, this clonal, uh, this dynamic clonal reorganization we now know can occur. It's important um, to realize that uh, we actually haven't, uh, as, a, as a community, exhaustively sampled this, this dynamic clonal evolution. Most of what we've done has been uh, examining single time points in time and space. We've done this. This is largely what um, has been done in the, the larger public efforts. So we have very detailed maps of, of mutation and co-mutation from, from this space, but we do not uh, yet appreciate fully the, the dynamic nature of disease, especially under treatment selection. So I think that's, that's an important opportunity uh, that lies uh, before us now and one that we're going to try and, and explore uh, right down to the single cell level uh, using methods now that we have in place uh, to profile uh, single cells uh, at the level of the genome. Um, one last point uh, before we close, uh, a major emphasis here as you would expect for a, for a cancer uh, agency that, that services a, a population um, of BC. BC for those of you that, that don't know, uh, is about twice the, the area of California. It's only got five million people in it. Um, so that's our population, and, and the cancer agency has a mandate for managing that population. Genomic medicine uh, is very much in vogue here. Uh, there is a now a stereotypical pipeline, which sees whole genome sequencing and RNA-seq uh, quite centrally in the pipeline, and a system by which these data are reduced uh, to reports on targets and other things of clinical utility. There's a discussion about all of these data in the context of a multidisciplinary uh, board, uh, and certain examples of these data are being acted on by the oncologist. Amazingly, uh, in our jurisdiction, uh, is we have the direct participation now of more than uh, three-quarters of all the medical oncologists in the province of British Columbia, so there's quite an emphasis here. And we look forward to, to uh, exploring this space thoroughly uh, in the future. Uh, this is all enabled by 150 people uh, that participate in our, our oncogenomics program, the vast majority of which here are, are medical oncologists, uh, with uh, bioinformatics and genome sciences being actually uh, minor, minor players in terms of sheer numbers. So that's just some thoughts, uh, this clonal dynamic nature right down to, to, to single cell resolution, uh, important for us, that's where we think we're headed, uh, and, uh, and who knows where we'll get to, but that'll be an emphasis as well as this uh, business of trying to understand in clinical real time, uh, in clinical samples, uh, how these, these clonal dynamics uh, change. Uh, with that, um, I'll have, give you a garbled slide that uh, looked much better when I uh, viewed it on my screen. 320 people at the Genome Center. This is uh, the list of them and, and many funders that have uh, contributed to our, our, uh, our cancer program. So with that, I'll close uh, and, and uh, apologize once again for the, the unusual uh, venue. I hope that I could be heard in my breathless uh, account of, of past history. Thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute. Uh, and I guess there may be a few moments uh, for questions at, uh, at Jeff's leisure, or Chris, or whoever's running the show uh, at your end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Well, that was, it was, I think it was quite effective, even though we're separated by a few miles. Uh, I uh, invite anyone who has questions to please come to the mic so that uh, Marco can hear us. Um, Marco, I'll, I'll start off with a question. So uh, a number of the people you spoke of um, spent quite large portions of their careers very focused, just laser focused on developing new methods, and yet almost all of them also used those methods, uh, among many others, to reveal really important insights into biology and uh, often a very high medical relevance. 
Are you have any thoughts on uh, on how those ways of thinking in science uh, interact with each other, uh, support each other? Well, the, the technology development angle uh, is absolutely, of course, critical uh, to to everything that we do. Um, the the very interesting observation is that you know we we quite frequently will buy a piece of hardware to, to perform a task and then be dramatically disappointed in its inability to execute the thing that we wanted it to do. Um, and so in our in our own shop, uh, the ability to, to engineer, rethink, build, uh, these things are, are absolutely critical. And, and in our experience, are, are in our context anyways, best driven from the, the end use and vision. I think a good example of this, you know, the, the infrastructure around the fingerprinting, uh, most of that was designed by in-house engineers, became absolutely critical to our ability to, to participate in, in these NHGRI projects. Another example uh, is uh, the creation of a, a robot that was capable of running uh, hundreds of RNA samples for purposes of size separating out microRNAs. This allowed us uh, to participate in the TCGA uh, manufacturing, I don't know, 12, 15,000 microRNA libraries, uh, very high quality libraries with size selected uh, RNA. We could not have done that manually. So it's incredibly enabling. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't do without it, Jeff. Any other questions? If not, uh, thank you once again, Marco. We very much enjoyed your talk. And I hope your recruitments go swimmingly. OK. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity once again. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. <laughs> and with that, we'll close. Thanks a lot, folks. Bye-bye.